celebrate courage. He fought for civil rights, voting rights, human rights, uh, diversity and inclusion. We celebrate trailblazers. I honestly didn't really feel like it was that big of a deal until the reaction started coming in. At least for me being the first, I mean, we're in 2023 now, and 2022 to still be the first woman of color to ever hold this title for um, a professional organization. That's big. That's big. Um, we still have so much further to go. We celebrate a rich past. So really, the roots of Phoenix can be traced right back to the, this very park. It's very, very important as a symbol of how communities can come together and thrive. We celebrate awareness. It's a blessing that we can be highlighted in February and people get an opportunity to see some of what we do. But please know that every single day we walk it, we talk it, we live it, and it's available for people, you know, throughout the year with the other productions. It's part of our, our history to not only uh, to show it, but to preserve it and to support it. We celebrate Black history. You're watching an Arizona's Family Special, celebrating Black history. Thank you for joining us. I'm Yetta Gibson. In 1976, President Gerald Ford officially recognized February as Black History Month. The month of February was chosen to honor the birth months of Frederick Douglass and President Abraham Lincoln. Well, today we celebrate the accomplishments of the past and look hopefully at the future. We celebrate Black History. We start with two women who are trailblazers making history in the world of sports this year, not just here in Arizona, but across the country. As we were setting up for this interview at Provision Coffee in Phoenix, these two customers, young Arizona State University students, sprouted out of their seats after finding out who the two women were being featured in this piece. I love the titles. I can't even believe these titles are associated with these women. So congratulations on your job. Thank you. Morgan Cato moved to Phoenix from New York just a few months ago. Her new job at the Phoenix Suns, vice president of basketball operations. She's also the team's assistant general manager, the first woman of color to ever hold these titles in the NBA. Latasha Kelsey grew up in Phoenix on the west side of the valley and her new job at Phoenix Raceway, track president and the first black woman ever in NASCAR's history to hold this title. I have been referring to you guys as female black women trailblazers in sports. Can I call you that? Sure. Yeah. I will have to take your word for it. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, you know, it's almost as if you only walk in the, the you know, your own skin. Yeah. So you don't always know the full impact of your actions until we have responses like that. Yeah. Um, you know, little black, black queens that look just like us and are coming after us. Like that's when you know, oh, this is something. I have two boys, 11 and 15, and uh, the 15 year old said, mom, you're a big deal. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, shoot, maybe I made it. <laughs> what has been uh, different about your job versus what you thought it was gonna be? The immediate receptivity. You didn't think that would happen? Not as easy as it did happen. Literally from one of my first days, you know, there early on and going to meet the guys for shoot around and warm ups and in kicks and in sweats. Like, um, I haven't worn heels in months. I miss them, they're, they're stacked nicely. But when you get responses from the guys are like, we're glad to have you here. Like, oh, we've been waiting for you. We've heard great things about you. You don't even hear that level of genuineness in traditional corporate environments. The woman that was in the role before this, she's the one who reached out to me and asked, um, if this is something that I would consider. My initial reaction was, really? And she started going through the list of reasons why, and those were things like your leadership, your inspiration, your impact, the things that you can do for Phoenix Raceway and for this community. Um, I had to take a pause and listen, and, and so I was terrified um, to take on something like this, um, but at the same time, couldn't be more grateful, and I'm just looking forward to putting my sparkle on uh, on the raceway. Oh, you probably have a lot of sparkle. I am? I can tell. <laughs> yeah, you know, we got the magic. <laughs> That's for sure. That's definitely magic. Yeah. She is also hoping to change the way people of color view NASCAR. I will tell you, I hope both of you plan to come to a race because the experience of NASCAR is some, not, it's not what you normally see on TV. You know, for people like us, uh, we don't necessarily think that it's a welcoming environment. I will tell you, it's very welcoming. Um, it's an amazing experience for the fans. So how is it being first 
What is the experience? We want to know. We're in 2023 now. In 2022, to still be the first woman of color to ever hold this title for um, a professional organization. There are plenty of talented human beings of every walk of life that I'm sure um, have the ability to do this type of work. When I walk into the room, you already know who I am, right? <laughs> for, for, for those so girls? Yes. yes, for so many reasons, right? There are young girls, like those girls that we saw earlier, um, that when we walked up, we're like celebrities, and in my mind, I'm, I'm just Latasha that leads the raceway. At the end of the day, you have individuals like that who are saying, wow, I could do that too. I, I always want to celebrate black history 365 days a year. Will we be able to do that? And we not meaning just us, the three of us black girls here. What about the others, right, that we have in our networks and how do they celebrate? I want to make sure that we're not continuing to replicate, you know, the challenges that we've experienced in the past, that we're making space for new leaders. It's a journey, but that's why you put one foot in front of the other and that's why we're comfortable shoes. I want to take a moment of personal privilege to honor a man who lived his life in service to this state. Governor Katie Hobbs there starting her state of the state last month, recognizing the passing of a local civil rights leader and community icon. Mel Hanna was 84 and he dedicated his life to public service, paving the way for so many people of color to become our leaders of today and tomorrow. I talked with his family, friends and mentees who hope to carry on the spirit of his legacy. This was right after we had established African American Commission. Look who's right there in the middle, Mr. Mel Hanna. Leah Landrum Taylor can't help smiling, talking about her dear friend and confidant. Even in situations that everyone could be completely unearthed, unshaken, unnerved about, he had a way of saying, let's really think this through and let's look at all sides. Reflecting on her 16 years in the state legislature, her mentor, Mel Hanna, by her side for all her firsts. You're the first African-American woman to run the Senate Minority Caucus, and then in your last year in the legislature, the only African-American lawmaker. This wasn't in the 1900s, this was 2015. Right, even now. I think that there's still just one African-American in the legislature. She says Mel Hanna taught her to always keep pushing and to never stop engaging people you disagree with. You might be the only one sitting there, but you're not the only voice that can be heard. Born in Winslow, Arizona, Mel Hanna stayed true to his roots, always fighting for rural representation. The first African-American on the Flagstaff City Council and Coconino County Board of Supervisors, he moved to Phoenix Director of Community Outreach with the Urban League, helping inmates transition to meaningful jobs, and was one of the first to lead the Arizona Commission on African-American Affairs. He fought for civil rights, voting rights, human rights, diversity and inclusion. Joe Delgado worked with Mel, a force of nature in wisdom and willpower. Walking the streets, registering voters, we traveled the state. He introduced me to everybody. In 1966, mm. when the burning and everything was going on, I watched Mel take a gym full of people, and he said, well, have you thought about this this way? Homer Townsend remembers Mel being a voice of peace at the peak of the civil rights movement. Mel was phenomenal. He could bring everybody together. Cousin Jerry Easley and niece Anna Battle humbled by his legacy. Uncle Mel had a pure heart and that he could reach out and work with different people, different eras in life and periods of time and, and find a way to weave through in the midst of mess, love, laughter, joking, encouragement, growth. A peace broker and a jokester. Everybody had a nickname. He was Foots, yes. and I was Ruth the Gal, and I, my mother was Stinky Dinky. Known for his signature silver hair, tan jacket, and old school flip phone with an infinite Rolodex of key players from here to DC. It was the busiest flip phone, I think, in all of Arizona. That charming, endearing spirit, contagiously inspiring. He truly believed in giving his time his life to helping others and helping make this state and our country 
a better place. In that spirit and in his honor, those whose lives were touched by Mel Hanna taking a collective vow to continue his legacy. And if we could carry on with that, wow, what a place, what a place we would have. We have an update on someone we profiled just a couple of years ago. We sat down with then newly appointed and first African-American police chief in Tempe, Jeffrey Glover. We featured him alongside the first African-American mayor of Tempe, Corey Woods. And we are proud to report Chief Glover is making history once again. He was recently appointed by new Arizona Governor Katie Hobbs as the director of the Arizona Department of Public Safety, the first African-American to hold this position here in Arizona. Glover has been in law enforcement for more than 20 years. All right, all right. Yeah. Keeping the legacy of black history alive with art inside the only black owned gallery in the state and why the owners do not want it to stay that way. And a main say in the art scene why the black theater troupe works to use their voices on and off the stage. Before the break, we are shining a spotlight on Swindle Tourist Inn, originally built as a private residence in 1913. The home, located near 10th Street and Washington Street in downtown Phoenix, turned into a place for weary travelers. By 1920, the owners began to take in African-American tourists who, at the time, had no other place to stay. Although the home was sold to the Swindle family in 1940, it continued to serve as a boarding house. Today, it is a professional office space. You're watching an Arizona's Family Special, celebrating black history. We are shining a spotlight on George Washington Carver High School. Built in 1926, the school located at 4th Street and Grant in Phoenix was the only high school in the state built explicitly for segregation of African Americans. The school was built not because of any law in place, but rather local sentiment which urged racial separation. Today, the building is a museum and a cultural center that honors and shares African American heritage, arts, and culture. Keeping stories of the black community alive. This is done in so many ways. One of those, theater. The actors and actresses and those behind the scenes at the Black Theater Troupe say they strive to highlight and empower black voices. The Black Theater Troupe has been a mainstay in the Phoenix art scene for decades, founded by Helen Catherine Mason in September 1970. Let's see if there's any famous ones up there. Since then, hundreds of black actors, actresses, directors, playwrights, and crew members have put on many productions. Actress Rico Burton, seen here in the troupe's production of Ma Rainey, now she's set to star as Bertha Holly in the upcoming production of August Wilson's Joe Turner's Come and Gone. Bertha Holly is a very pivotal character here. She's kind of the glue that keeps things together. There, it, it's amazing to see this character because in the 1900s, the early 1900s, a lot of people of color didn't own things. Well, she and her husband owned this boarding house. And so they're entrepreneurs, if you will. She's been involved with the troupe for more than 20 years. Her mission is to help share and promote the experience of black voices. It's important because it gives people an opportunity to expand their own perspectives, to see things from more than one point of view, and to challenge themselves, sometimes correct themselves. Executive Director David Hemphill. It's been said, and I've, um, I've always learned, been taught, that um, our humanity is reflected um, through our culture and through the arts. And he says it's the art they create that has made them an indispensable part of the city's cultural landscape, coming a long way from a small theater to this one off 14th Street in Washington, made possible by taxpayers. Here in Arizona, there isn't a very large African-American population. So some of my friends back east 
um, say that we really do a big accomplishment by doing um, black theater in a state where there are no black people. He says the audience is majority African-American, but they put on work for everyone to enjoy. There are so many people moving here to this part of the country, and they're coming from larger places that were more expensive, and those larger places have a very, uh, very vibrant cultural scene. So I think that that's one of the main reasons that our niche has grown uh, to become so important nationally as well as uh, locally. Burton wants to remind everyone that they do the work of lifting black voices every day, whether it's on the stage or in their own lives. It's a blessing that we can be highlighted in February and people get an opportunity to see some of what we do. But please know that every single day we walk it, we talk it, we live it, and it's available for people, you know, throughout the year with the other productions. The Black Theater Troupe will get an award from the August Wilson House in Pittsburgh as it's one of the few companies in the U.S. to have produced all 10 of August Wilson's Pittsburgh Cycle plays. These plays portray African-American life over distinct decades, with one play for a separate decade touching on themes relative to the African-American community. In addition to expression and storytelling through theater, we celebrate through art. I spent time with Mr. Vernon and Mrs. Kathy Williams. Mm -hmm. They run the only black-owned art gallery here in Phoenix. Black history is art. It's the heartbeat of a community. With every brush stroke, it reveals stories of the past, present, and future. It's raw emotions left to personal interpretation. You can find that and so much more at this unique art gallery. Black American art is important because this is an opportunity to authentically show the culture. Certainly it can be shown uh, in any setting, but from one black American to, a, you know, to another, you can relate. Black art means, to, what it means to me is the ability to see myself in, on, on a canvas. It's part of our, our history to not only uh, to show it, but to preserve it and to support it. I enjoy all art, but it's just something about black art that I can actually sit down and relate and say, that's me. Literally, there was a need. At the time that we started um, in 2016, there were no black-owned galleries in Phoenix. And so we decided, you know, to fill that void. And whereas, you know, the gallery is black-owned, it's all-inclusive, we've shown artists, you know, that are not black Americans. I mean, our focus is really just on the art culture overall, but specifically giving a home uh, to black American artists. Art is expression. Right? As you said, each piece tells a story out of time. Uh, literally, uh, sand running through your hands, you know? The sands of time running through your hands. What are we doing here? Am I using my time wisely? We really didn't see art that was, was created by uh, black individuals. So we felt it was important and it was our job to uh, create this gallery so it'd be presented more. People have a place to come see art by uh, black individuals. So a lot of people when they walk in, they always say, oh, I love the vibe in this place. Yes. So that's very, very intentional. You want to have a jam session? Don't bring your stuff. I have everything here. Just come and jam. We are uh, not just a gallery. We are an event space. Jazz shows, because that's the other thing that we do very well here. It's the live music, which is just another form. You know, it's another form of art. We didn't know that we would be the only Black-owned gallery for a very long time. We don't want to be the only one. We want to see ourselves uh, mirrored all over the valley. Art is just a peek into the soul. Yeah. It shows you everything that that person's about and what they're thinking about, what they've been through, what they're going through, and how they express themselves to show that they who they are.
Grace Park is in the heart of Phoenix and served as a safe haven for the black community. We take a closer look at the rich history of East Lake Park. But first, we are shining a spotlight on murals around the valley. This mural project started in 2021 to celebrate black history and it continues to grow. The Shining Light Foundation kicked off the project with 28 pieces of art representing the 28 days in the month of February. Today, they have 56 completed murals and are adding another 28 right now. The murals have been strategically placed on the side of restaurants, offices, and other buildings too. They feature a wide range of prominent black figures who have had an impact on music, art, culture, politics, education, and society. For a list of all the murals and their locations, you can check it out. We have a link on our website, azfamily.com. You're watching an Arizona's Family Special, celebrating Black history. We are shining a spotlight on Progressive Builders Association. The group formed in 1945 with one goal, to help African-American soldiers returning from World War II buy homes. Most lenders would deny them loans, so this organization built a community of ranch-style homes they could buy. The former building on 20th Street and Broadway also housed other Black-owned businesses. East Lake Park is located just outside of downtown Phoenix. It's in the Garfield District. It has a playground, it has artwork, a baseball field, a swimming pool even. But what many Valley residents might not realize is that it also has a complicated legacy intertwined with Black history in Arizona. I don't think there is a more important place in the valley for people to learn about and understand and appreciate than East Lake Park because it's a prime example of even in the face of incredible segregation and discrimination, the black people that lived in the area found a place where they could have a grounded community and it was a safe place for them to congregate and spend time together. Originally, the park was for all citizens, all ethnicities and so forth. And as Phoenix started to grow, unfortunately, a lot of the developers north of Van Buren and then around in Kennel Park and the more populated areas, they actually discriminated big time against the black people. Because of the discrimination and segregation, the community for the black folks was, was established right here put up churches like Pilgrim's Rest. There was a number of restaurants in the area that, that were friendly places for African-Americans at that time. There was actually a lake there and uh, people could go boating, uh, do all kinds of recreation activities. You can see the swimming pool there. Originally, that was what was called a natatorium. It was an indoor swimming pool. Streetcar, the trolley at that time ran along here. There were issues with, with black people riding on it, but it was available. Here in 1911, Booker T. Washington uh, actually did speak here in, uh, I think it was about September of uh, 1911. So there have been some very prominent folks that have, that have spoken here. Martin Luther King did speak here just probably about six weeks before the Civil Rights Act was passed. He didn't speak here at the park. He spoke at Tanner Chapel, which is about 8th Street in Washington. Calvin Good, who was on the Phoenix City Council for about 22 years, he actually lived right over there. and. Uh, spoke here and, and hung out with people quite a bit. Uh, Juneteenth was actually celebrated first in Phoenix in 1911, and it finally was celebrated here starting in 1921. And now every year since then, there's a big Juneteenth celebration here at East Lake Park. This monument gives a chronology of all of the activities around around African Americans and civil rights and so forth. And stand here, understand that this was probably one of the few safe havens in town 
for black people in the early part of the 20th century. Thanks, Daryl. That is all the time we have for today. We hope you enjoyed this look at black history here in Arizona. On behalf of our entire crew, thanks so much for watching our Arizona's Family Special, Celebrating Black History. I'm Yetta Gibson.